Here, so firstly, there's a handout here at the front, um, as, as is usual. And let's put today's class in perspective. We've looked so far at linear programming. That was the first month, January. Then February, we moved into looking at the midterm and nonlinear optimization. And when we started nonlinear optimization, we were looking at the trivial case where we've got an unconstrained single variable function. Then we moved that up to still unconstrained but multi multiple variables, and that's not so trivial anymore. Now it's using Newton's method and line searches. And today's class, we're going to start to get up to what is going to be our final picture, a fully multivariable with constrained system. Okay, so we're going to investigate that over the next few classes, fully multivariable with constraints. So how do we deal with it? Well, we're going to look at uh, method one and two today and then leave three and four for later on. Uh, method one is actually what I had said in the previous section. We can simply ignore our constraints. Right? We can say, if we look, let's look at a concrete example of optimizing a distillation column. You would have um, normally you would have constraints in there for flooding, for weeping, for a minimum reflux ratio, for safety operations. But you could just take the equations of the distillation column, optimize it, so maybe look at maximizing profit from the distillation column, ignoring constraints, and then once you get to a solution, you check whether that solution obeys the constraints. So then you can check, does my solution um, not flood the column? Is it still safe to operate? Is, it, is there going to be no weeping? And if you're lucky, and that, often, that is often the case, um, you fall into that region and you can just use your unconstrained solution. The next method that we can do is uh, add a penalty term to our objective. So what I mean by this is let's take a look at this. We've got our function f of x that we're hoping to minimize. And we've got two types of constraints, inequalities and equalities. One way we can simply uh, modify the objective function is to take these g of x and h of x inequalities and equalities respectively and add them to the objective function. So we're going to look at an example here in a minute, but take a look at this objective function f of x. This is going to be our new objective function. And we take our original objective function f of x and add a penalty to it. So take my original plus a penalty. So everything that comes now after this is a penalty, and we're going to penalize it with some amount mu. Okay, so mu is 0, there's, there's no penalty. So already we see right away that mu must be a number that's positive. Right? It doesn't make sense to penalize this with a negative, because we're trying to minimize. Right? So we're still going to try and minimize capital F by taking our original function f of x that we're hoping to minimize and adding something to it. And if we can add something significant to it, the optimizer will hopefully try to minimize this as well as the original function f of x and get us a solution that is optimum and doesn't have significant penalty portion. Okay, so by adding this penalty, we're hopefully going to get to a point that's close to the final objective. So we're going to see that geometrically. Why do I keep saying close? Because we're not going to land up exactly at the optimum. We're going to get close to it because this penalty term is going to be there. So we've got two types of constraints though. Inequalities and equalities. How do we deal with them? Well, the penalty terms go in here. And we're going to add penalties for every inequality and for every equality. So g of j of x is my inequality function expressed as less than or equal to 0. I'm going to convert this to its penalty form as follows. So every, uh, sorry, every inequality g of j is going to be penalized with a new function p of j. What does this function look like? Well, one thing we want to happen that's desirable is we don't want to penalize 
when that constraint is not violated. Okay, so let's say the left hand side here is less than zero. If the left hand side is less than zero, you don't want to add a penalty to your objective function. You only want to add a penalty to this objective function when the left hand side here is greater than zero. So if you're violating the constraint, then you want to penalize it. If you're not violating the constraint, it doesn't make sense to penalize it. Okay? So one way we can enforce that is by saying, well, let this new function pj of x, so I'm going to add this over here, pj of x, is let pj of x be the maximum of either 0 or the original inequality. So if g of j is less than 0, what's the output of this? 0. zero. OK, if g of j is greater than 0, g of j. g of j. OK, so you're not going to penalize if g of j is less than 0. You're only going to penalize when g of j is greater than 0. OK, so that's why we, we write it that way. And what we go do furthermore is we go raise it to some power gamma. Okay, now if gamma is equal to one, that's an in, that's an easy um, interpre, interp, uh, interpretation. If gamma is equal to two, then you're giving a quadratic penalty. If gamma is three, you're giving a cubic penalty. Okay, but notice that this term here inside the brackets, inside the round brackets, is always positive. So you're raising some positive number to the gamma. Gamma just tells how much you're going to penalize by. Okay, it's kind of like least squares. You've, those of you that are taking 4C with me, you know that there's a penalty function for least squares where you're penalizing the deviations from the error, or sum of squares of the errors would be the equivalent of gamma equals 2. You can do a quadratic penalty. Yes, Mark? Why wouldn't that term just be built into your g of j function? Like how much you're going to penalize? Okay, so we're, we're uh, trying to deal with constraints by not having a constraint problem. Okay, so g of j is currently a constraint. What I'm going to do is I'm going to bring it into my objective, and then I'm not going to have a constraint anymore. Okay. Right? So our goal is we're trying to be lazy. <laughs> we're trying to use what we've already done and learned yeah. and try and make that work without actually dealing with the constraint. So let's, um, let's take a look at an example. This is, um, well, just before we get to an example, sorry, let me just complete this up. Uh, let's take a look at equality constraints. Okay, so an equality constraint can be added here with a function q of j x. Okay, so p's are for inequalities and q's are for equalities. Okay, so what does hj of x look like? We'll call that qj of x will be its replacement. What might you think, I'll let you just think, what might a penalty function be over here that you could replace h of x with? We don't want to penalize it when that constraint is met. So when h of x is 0, you don't want a penalty. But when h of x is non-zero, you do want a penalty. So what could be? a way that you could replace that h function with a new function q. OK, so this is a suggestion. Let's just temporarily put it here, max of 0 or h. So just simply do the same thing. What if h is 5? Alex? The absolute, absolute value of h. OK, so if h is positive, this will add a penalty. But if h was negative, let's say minus 5, it's actually going to subtract from your penalty. And so that's, that's not desirable. So what we'll do is uh, we can take this and simply replace it with the absolute value of h. Okay. And what we'll do for consistency is we'll also raise this to the gamma. 
Okay, so you can again penalize quadratically if you choose gamma equals two, or you can simply penalize this, the absolute value, if gamma is equal to one. Okay, so those are two types of penalty functions. Every inequality is converted to a pj of x and added to your objective. Every equality is converted to a qj by taking the absolute value and then raising it to the power gamma. And then once your h's and your g's are moved into your objective function, you're back to an unconstrained optimization problem. Michelle. Oh, okay, good question. If g of x was written, um, say, something less than or equal to 5, you would modify that and uh, call it g of x minus 5 less than 0. So kind of get it into a standard format where all the left-hand sides, sorry, all the right-hand sides are zeros. Okay, so we... C Yeah, this is, this is going to, you're going to see is the standard way I'll write nonlinear constraint problems. It's always with a zero on the right-hand side. Yeah. We'll come back to that in a later class. But it's easy to convert to that format. Okay. Similarly, if you had a greater than or equal zero, you just flip the signs and flip the inequality around. So we can always get it into that format. Okay, now it's time for an example. And I'm not going to scroll this up because there's the solution down here. <laughs> um, so let's take a look at this. It's a, maybe a little bit low for those of you in the back, but you've all got the, the handout in front of you. Try to draw what P of X looks like for this particular inequality. G of X is equal to, and I've used the example 2 minus X equals zero. Sketch what that P of X function, that penalty looks like. I'm not seeing too many sketches. Don't be afraid to make mistakes on these notes. People are very hesitant. They want perfect notes. Use pencil if you really don't want to mess up your notes. But you've got to try and do this. OK, your first thing that you have to do is you have to pick a gamma. OK. How do you pick gamma? Suggestions. Uh, 
a power, sorry? So like next to one, or maybe if you have gamma one? Yeah, so gamma is, is totally under the user's control. Okay, you can set that, and in optimizers, you can set the value of gamma. As I said, gamma could be equal to one, in which case this is simply just the function as written, taking the gamma away. You could choose gamma equals two, and then that now becomes a quadratic penalty. Okay? So in many optimizers, a gamma of two is used. I'll show you a little uh, in shortly why the reason for that. So we have to pick that, and we'll, we'll, let's take gamma equals two for this illustration. When we're done here and, and you go home, you can change this gamma to another value and redraw this curve. Okay, so we're at this point now where gamma is equal to two. Let's just sub that in. Sorry, why did you say two? So it's a quadratic penalty. Okay. So now for different values of x, what does this look like? Let's start here over on the left. x equals to minus one. Two minus minus one is three. So the max of 3 or 0 squared is somewhere up here. It's a 9. Let's put in a value of 0, 0. 2 minus 0 is 2. Squared is 4. Okay. Put a value of 1 in there. 2 minus 1 is 1. Squared is 1. Okay. And then we've got a value of 2. 2 minus 2 is 0. 0 squared is 0. We're now at 0. Put a value of 3 in. 2 minus 3 is minus 1 squared. Uh, sorry, 2 minus 3 is minus 1. But the max of 0 and minus 1 is 0. Okay, so at 3 we've got a value of 0. The value of 4. 2 minus 4 is negative 2. Max of that is 0. So we're still at 0. So everything to the right of 2 is a flat line at 0. Put in a value of 3. 2 minus 3 is negative 1. Right, the maximum of 0 or a negative number is 0. Yeah, I'm just. Yeah, we're going to look at and then adding the square in. Okay, so I'm just, basically what I'm showing you here is just internally, and then now this is going to, we're going to square it and take it up again. Okay, so internally, from the right of 2, we've got a 0, and then we're going to square it in, and it's going to get added. Okay, so this is a quadrat, turned into a quadratic penalty then. No. <laughs> What's Dylan? Why did why did you uh, why did it go up after two? Okay, so why did it go up after two? Good question. Okay, so does it go up after two? No, it doesn't. It stays flat. My mistake. Okay, the reason my okay, so here you've got to understand why I make mistakes, right? It's no good just me admitting it to mistakes. I just didn't focus on the two right the squared part there. Okay. So what I was what I was thinking in, internally is you can look just at this internal part and we can look at the part squared. Okay, but I was thinking just of the internal part. Okay, let's uh, let's square the zero there and it, it goes goes and stays there at zero. Okay, so we've got no penalty from 2, 3, 4, and higher. And then below 2, we've got this quadratic penalty taking place. So when we're looking at adding this to the objective function, we're adding this term, what you're seeing here in black, in addition to the minimize. Okay, so if we look at this function, f of x is simply equal to x. We're trying to minimize that, subject to the constraints 2 minus x less than 0. Can you tell where the optimum is, just by looking at that over here? Take, take a few seconds, talk with someone next to you, and discuss where the optimum is for that problem.
Okay, where's the optimum? Devin? A value of 2. Okay, if we minimize this function, if we ignore the constraint, the minimum is at negative infinity. If we add that constraint, that constraint simply says x must be greater than or equal to 2. So that's another way of rewriting it. Flip the 2 over to the other side, you can see that x must be greater than 2. So the minimum occurs at the constraint boundary of 2. So that's got, got to be our final answer. So bear that in mind when we're looking at this penalty function. We're now going to take our function, f of x is equal to x. Let's perhaps uh, write it up here. So my new function, f of x, is going to be the original function plus the penalty term. So plus mu times, and then inside that big square bracket here, there's one constraint per sorry, one term per constraint. So we've got just one constraint. We're going to only have one term in that summation. So plus p of x in there. So let's sub in p of x. It's the maximum of 0 or 2 minus x. And we're going to raise that to the gamma equals 2. So that's going to be my revised objective function. This portion that we've drawn up here, this slide, uh, sorry, not the slide, this black line, is this term inside the square brackets, that maximum raised to the square. OK, so this, this portion here in red corresponds to that p of x function I've just drawn. So now the next question that we have to ask is, what do we use for mu? How does this curve change, this p of x, this p of x that I've drawn here in black is the case when mu is equal to 1. Okay, so here in black, this is the case for mu equals 1. What does that curve look like if mu is equal to 2? Does this part here on the right change? No. no? OK. So I'm going to draw the case for mu equals 2 here in red. Mu equals 2, this part stays at 0. So 0 multiplied by 2 is 0. What happens after this? Above the curve, a black line, below the black line? Above, OK. So that's the case for mu equals 2. Mu equals a half would be below. Okay, so so at mu then modifies how much you penalize your function by. So we've got to be clear on these two parameters, gamma and mu. Gamma tells to penalize qu every equation quadratically if gamma is 2, or if gamma equals 1, it just leaves the function as is. Mu penalizes an additional amount. Mu equals 0 is no penalty. Mu equals 0.5 is a weaker penalty. And as mu goes up, the penalties become stronger and stronger. Okay, so I'm going to come back to both those terms, gamma and mu, in a minute. Let's just take a look at this illustration, though, to help understand that. So here's that curve for various parameters of mu, 5, 1.5, and 0 0.5. So um, I will post this revised set of slides for you later on if you want to copy it exactly over. But you've got that idea from prior. Now let's go take a look here, and you've got it in front of you as well. When I take my original f of x and add it to mu p of x. So f of x in this particular case is simply x. The function I'm trying to minimize is simply x. And so what we notice here is that when we add this curve p of x plus f of x from 2 onwards to the right, we get a straight line with a slope of 1. That's the portion of simply 
x because p of x to the right of that is simply 0. When we go to the left, then those, that general shape stays. So the revised objective function, capital F, is what's the second graph. You can add that there to the, to the axis. That's capital F of x. And that's what we're going to minimize. And we notice this for any value that we pick for mu, it has a unique minimum. But that minimum has a problem. What do you notice about those three curves on the sec second plot? Michelle? They're still violating the constraint. OK? Notice that. The optimum for the green optimization is at 1. The optimum for the red optimization, mu 1.5, lies below 2. So it violates the constraint. Even when we go as high as mu equals 5, we're still violating the constraint. The optimum is to the left of 2. OK, so this penalty function approach gets us close to the optimum, but it doesn't get us to the optimum. That's, that's the key insight we have to have. Okay. We've made our problem easy. right? We've gone back to all the tools we know now, Newton's method and the quasi-Newton's method. We can use those. So we're, we're not using any new technology. But this approach of trying to make this fit into that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to get a true optimum that, that um, is feasible. Okay, so what we also noticed here is the penalty is only added if the constraint is violated. We've, we've learned that quite carefully. And here's now back to the way we choose gamma. Gamma is 2 versus gamma equals 1. Those are the two main choices we have. Gamma equals 2 gets you a function that's differentiable. Provided that this function that's inside here is also differential to begin with. Okay, so we can't make this differentiable if what's inside there is not. But if what's inside here is differentiable, raising to the power of 2 gets you a smooth differentiable first derivative. Why is that important? Devin? We need the derivatives to be smooth and existing for Newton's method, or the, even the quasi-Newton's methods. OK, so that's an important part, is the choice of gamma equals 2. If gamma is equal to 1, you get a differentiable function, but it won't be smooth. Why is that? Look back at Q of x, Michelle. The Q of x that you wrote in the page in front of you, what do you notice about it when gamma is equal to 1? Adam? You get a very sharp inflection. It's the absolute value. Okay, So you get that triangle point, and that point is not differentiable. I mean, sorry, it is differentiable, but it's not smooth at, at that point. Okay, So at that, at that apex of the absolute value, it's not smooth. So gamma equals 1 is problematic for that purpose. Okay. So when we look at these penalty functions here, in practice, what the algorithms will do is they go and they start with mu equals very small. So they'll start with a value of just above 0, giving you a very mild penalty. And that will be our first iteration. So we can perhaps write that up here. Our first iteration, mu 0, will add a small penalty to the function. Then our second iteration goes and uses a mu that's just a little bit larger. But once we do that, we actually go use our prior solution as the initial guess to resolve the optimization problem with mu equals 1. Let's take a look at that. At the green case, let's say we started with mu equals 0.5 for our first iteration. Our optimum is at 1. That's a great initial guess for the next time we try to resolve the optimization, but using mu equals 1.5. And, and then we go higher still, and then We'll perhaps use mu equals 2, mu equals 5, mu equals 10. We'll step up our mu values every successive iteration until we, we've, we want to terminate, until the change that happens from one iteration to the next is relatively small. You mean the opposite of what's on the right? Mu 1 is greater than 
U0 is, yes, <laughs> thank you. I'm going to blame the daylight saving change. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so successive optimizations of mu use larger and larger values. OK, anything unclear before we move on from this point? OK, so let me recap. The penalty function approach is a weak way to try and resolve our, our objective function by using tools that we already know. It's imperfect. You have to use and choose values of gamma and, and mu. And furthermore, as we notice, even with this very trivial example, you'll only approach the true optimum. You won't necessarily be feasible. Okay. Sorry, I missed. What were you saying? What area is not smooth? Wait, on your, your minimum? OK, so uh, the, the idea of smoothness goes back to the choice for, for gamma. Let me just quickly clear up some space here. So if gamma is equal to 1, for the case of q of x, we said that q of x is equal to the absolute value of my original function h raised to the gamma. Gamma is equal to 1. I don't need to put that there anymore. Okay. The moment we take the absolute value, we get that sort of thing happening. Okay, and that's not smooth. So Newton's method, imagine Newton's method is over here and, and heading towards the optimum. The slope is pointing in this direction, and then there's going to be the sudden curve, and it, 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 won't, it won't converge after that. Okay, so that smoothness is an, is an important factor of if it's square, it won't. It will have a, round, a rounded point. OK, so let's move on from there. And we're going to come back to the idea of using an unconstrained approach to solve a constrained problem in the next, um, in, in one, uh, one class from now. Um, we're going to then look at Lagrange multipliers. So hold that in your head. Lagrange multipliers is something you've seen in your second year math course. I know that. So we're going to um, look at that approach next. Before we move on to the next problem, which is just a, a, a little bit of a diversion to get some practice, um, one important announcement is Wednesday's class is really important. We have a guest speaker. Um, she's an optimization expert that I've known for 14, 15 years. She works at Hatch, um, has worked for Honeywell and a variety of other companies in between, but is now currently at Hatch and does some incredible work with optimization. She's been a, a guest speaker here for the dean um, on a prior occasion. Um, I know her because we went to grad school together. You've, in fact, met her husband. Um, her husband, Leo, gave the talk at 4N uh, last year. So Danielle will be here on, on Wednesday's class, and I highly recommend you come to that discussion. She's going to show a great cross-section of optimization problems she works on. OK, so let's. Um, Go back to this problem. This is a chance for you to practice formulating a problem. We're trying to locate an airstrip for a distribution center, very similar to one of the questions in the assignment. Where do you locate something so that it's optimal? So there's three factories. Draw a grid here in this open space, an XY grid. Three factories at those three locations and try to set up the problem. I'm not going to say any more than that, but give that a shot. Give you f a few minutes. Please talk with the person next to you to make sure that you've got the same line of thinking. Draw your grid as shown over there, because you're going to need positives or negatives.
What is your objective function? And what are the constraints? Okay, so once you've drawn your grid, figure out what that objective function looked like, what does the constraint look like. Do you want to just chat afterwards quick? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Ten fifty sixty nine see you. It's There's a small hint up on the board there. OK, so many of you have got your drawing now done nicely. Great. Uh, what does the objective function look like? What is f of x? OK, so the suggestion here is to superimpose on your diagram, just pick a random x, y point for your airstrip, and then minimize the distance between that point and those three points. The distance between that point and the other three points. OK, so convert that to mathematics. Right, this is uh, in your feedback for the class evaluation, you had hoped for seeing more formulation problems. This is what formulation is. Converting English to math. You can call it translation, formulation. Can you make contours of like uh, uh, of the, um, like when we did the city example with like the population? Uh, yeah. We yeah. We, but that for that you need a, a, a function f of x to make <laughs> contours for. Right. So what does that f of x look like? OK, so what is the constraint? 
sorry, what does the objective function perhaps look like? Any suggestions for what the math would look like? Oh, Devin? Okay, so 950 times the square root of x squared. Okay, Devon's suggestion, agreement, disagreement, lots of head shaking yes, head shaking no, no. What part don't you understand here? Michelle? Somehow you'd have to avoid that square. Somehow you'd have to avoid... Oh, okay. So Michelle's concerned about the the read. So sixty ninety. So what's our, lo our our objective is to locate a runway. a runway. Okay. So we're going to put a runway here, for example, x y. So as long as we can fly over the wildlife region, this constraint is okay. Okay, so we're flying to our bases, <laughs> okay? So yeah, x, y is over there, and we're going to fly over the wildlife to zero, zero, or fly from x, y to minus 90, or fly to here. Okay, so we can fly over the, that region, but it's a good point you make because in some regions of the world that won't be allowed. Okay, so then you would need to handle it differently. OK, but let's assume, let's make this problem a little simpler, where we can fly across. So it's the straight line Euclidean distance from x, y to each of the three bases, with weights for the amount of cargo carried to the respective base. Okay, So this is a plausible objective function. It seems reasonable. But again, alternatives could exist. Now. What, it look, what would the constraints look like in this instance? Would there be any constraints? No? The points can be as, can be OK, mathematics. Points can't be inside the rectangle. What is that mathematically? We need practice with this. 10 is less than or equals to x, which is less than or equals to 16. So x is less than or equal to 10. x greater than or equal to 60. y less than or equal to 50. y greater than or equal to 90. OK, and you can convert those to standard form quite, quite straightforward. Let's take a. A look at that. Let's take the y greater than 90 example. So y greater than equals to 90. How do we get that into our standard form? We'll bring y over to the right hand side and then just uh, multiply through by minus 1. So that's negative y plus 90 less than or equal to 0. Okay, so we can get them expressed with zeros less than or equal to 0 on the right hand side. Devin? No. OK, so it could violate. 
sorry, x less than 10 or x greater than 60, there are two separate constraints. One constraint and not the other. OK. You're picking up on a subtlety here that I, I'm glad, because we're going to look at this in the integer section. OK. So it's either one of these is active or the other is active. So x is less than 10 works, or x less than 60 works. OK. So I'm. Let's, I just want to pause there. I don't want to go into too much complexity there, but I'm going to have you look at this in GANs in the next assignment and see what happens. Yeah, Brandon? If you have an x value of between those two, it's a positive one. Right. And again, it brings into that uh, you've now created an infeasible region there where the runway strip could exist. OK. Is that what you're going to say, Michelle? OK. So you're seeing that this is an, a fairly imperfect characterization of the problem, but Hold the thought, we're going to look at it in the integer section. OK? So we've got a lot of good ideas here from this class, a lot of good conceptions. Now, there's not enough time left to start the next topic. So this uh, section here on concave and convex optimization, we're going to look at it in, in the week after next. Just before we uh, finish up for today, about the project. So the project uh, write-up is due sometime today. It's not your final project. It's a, simply a proposal for what you'd like to do your project on. I'll reply back to you and point out some issues, whether I accept it or it's too easy or too difficult. Um, so we'll modify the scope iteratively. I won't be able to reply to the emails today, as those of you um, that have already sent me, you'll get a response from me probably on Tuesday. So by the end of tonight, I need those, so then tomorrow morning I'll work on that uh, response back to you, okay?